Um, I grew up in the Flanders and at um, the age of five, six, my mother began to traffic me into a murderous pedophile network, which was run by the political and the business elite of Belgium. I was one of the, what's called expendables. I didn't know that term, of course, but I knew that my life was worth absolutely nothing. At age nine, I was trafficked outside of the country and taken to uh, different places, to Switzerland, uh, France, and then to the United States. And one particular very well-known, very powerful man um, took a liking to me and then had me trained for a month, uh, torture-based, to make me into a ch child sex slave, spy, killer. That was to be my journey. And eventually, when I saw the my main perpetrator, I call it because he was so impactful, uh, when I saw him again and I realized that I had been trained to be a slave, I got angry and was then very uh, vilely rejected, but not killed, and returned to Belgium, operated in that network in Belgium for another year before I was finally rescued, dramatically rescued by someone from the inside, another perpetrator who got me out. You were being sexually abused from the age of six. Yeah. And you were forced to have sex with grown men at that young age. When or how, no, when, when did you first realize that what was happening was was bad right from the start you knew right from the start yes i strongly believe that the love that i'd received from the woman in my first years gave me a sense of right and wrong i had a sense of myself i had been i received the reflection of myself as a, an innocent sweet little baby and i could be myself that's to say at that time a tiny human being in her presence, she accepted that, she nurtured it. So I felt seen and I had always had a sense of right and wrong. So the very first time I was taken to the network, I in fact stood up and told everyone there, which was an orgy, that I was gonna make sure they all go to jail. They can't do this. This, this caregiver that, that looked after you, you, felt, you, you explained that you felt a sense of love from her. Did you feel a sense of love from your mum? No, never. Never. How did that make you feel? My, my mother and my stepfather, I never felt any love. And even though I loved them, and I hoped they, would, they were what they pretended to be, they, you know, I just really never experienced any love from them. But the first perpetrator, the main perpetrator, I should say, that was devastating. That was much more heartbreaking and in fact affected me a lot more deeply than my stepfather, as well as um, the perpetrator who finally got me out. So that was one who ended up coming through in a way. You, you kind of hear about this kind of stuff happening in even in the UK, in government and stuff like that. And I think for, for most of us, we can't, it's so unimaginable that we can't get our head around it. And it's almost like, because it's so unimaginable, the thought, the thought of it being real is just, it's just not, it's, it's too far-fetched, it's too extreme, it's just, it's just too much. We know there's bad things that happen in the world, but that's just too much. Obviously, you have done a lot of research over the years and you've been exposed to an awful lot. It's obviously, in, through your experience, far wider spread than, than any of us can imagine. Well, I work with survivors. So 
I'd say yes. Children, a lot of children are being trained um, to be slaves. And then even if the, the children from families that are involved are trained as well. And so they just get specific tasks. And, um, and because dissociation is part of the training, the, the calling out altars is part of the training, those people would not know what they're doing when they're being um, called or when, they're, when, they're, when they're, there's a code that brings up a certain altar. Now, I wasn't trained specifically like that. It was a little different for me. I wasn't trained in that way in which we hear about MK Ultra. Um, but as far as in the high realms of power, what happens there? Yes. So I was exposed to that in the 70s, and my perpetrators were um, the some of the world leaders of that time. You know, the top of the country, prime ministers, presidents. Have you ever have you ever publicly mentioned anyone's names? No, um, no, I, I, a little bit. The Belgian, so the the Belgian prime minister. He was not prime minister at the time. He was the minister of national defense. Um, his name is Paul van Buynans. So, you know, I've I've named the Belgians, and then the Belgians used the, the children and myself included to become friends with some of the, the top people. So I was gifted to someone, to the American, for example, that, that was very powerful. So I, I, I don't feel um, that I can name those people, even, if they're, even though they're dead. Um, it doesn't feel safe. And um, I'm not sure if it's my fear from the way in which I was indoctrinated and uh, told in no uncertain terms that I should never speak or I'd be killed. Um, there's that, but there's also, there is a real danger if you go out and say these names. And I know others have done it, but I want to just briefly touch on your statement before that, you know, it's too much to believe. And I understand that very much. Um, it was actually something that the people in that network were banking on that what is what they're doing is so extreme no one will ever believe you but well, yeah i think in my head at the moment is i have two daughters and so being a father of two daughters that obviously takes you to that place which is horrific to think about and then and then and then also i think of of this uh, Illuminati and the Freemasons and this these types of organizations and um, it, it gives me chills it really gives me chills let's tell, tell some more of the story so you you would you were going through this from the age of six until wh what age did you get say six to eleven so you're Going through your teenage years, this ends at 11. How, how, how do you transform? Because you then obviously go through puberty and, you know, adolescence and all that kind of stuff. And so your world starts to change as a, as a human being developing and evolving. How, how do you grow? What kind of person do you, uh, are you during those formative kind of teenage years? Well, I think I was a classic, um, rather messed up teenager as you could expect. Um, so I left home very early. At 15, I was just sleeping in other people's homes all the time and just sometimes at home. I wasn't officially gone, but I was barely at home. I left school at 15. Um, I moved out as soon as I could at 16. Um, I was even at, in the Red District for a little bit in Antwerp, um, just drawn there by people from the cafe. They went there for a joke and then I got offered <laughs> to you know have drinks with the men and then i did that but i didn't sleep with them and and that was because i the the, the man who the perpetrator who rescued me gave me instructions for life and it included never sleep with anyone for money and i also been told not to overdo it on drugs so i wasn't really i could take drugs if they were given to me but i could never do anything to get them so I couldn't really become a, 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 a drug addict. So I was saved in that way that I was listening to these instructions, but I was messed up and just floating as a teenager and, but not, not assaulted ever again. So I was quite lucky. 
and um, I left the country, 18, 19, um, and uh, also asked for the instructions, uh, said I had to, you know, go to London, Paris, New York, and I went and lived in all those places and ended up in New York. Okay. I've missed a bit out. I just want to get this bit done before we move on to the next bit. I missed a bit out with the guy that saved you. I want to just talk about that for a minute. The, the, the tell me that tell me how it happened. Did it was it was it something that came out of the blue? Could you see it brewing? Um, just 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 set the scene for me. Yes. Well, this perpetrator was not old. He was only 20, 21. and uh, he was a young gangster. So he had respect in the network because he used his gun, and. He um, also took a liking to me. I, I defied him when I first met him and he liked that. And I think it was my attunement to know what to do or say, just, you know, even, even if it seems strange. Um, but he protected me for a while. And once- how, 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 how did he protect you? He wouldn't allow anyone to rape me. Okay. No one could touch me. And he wasn't touching me either. So that was for, for six months. Then when the sex started with him, he immediately started to put all of his um, abuse on me. So it became very, very violent for the next six months. And that was going to result in my being killed. And um, I, he had given me over, let's say, and I was about to be tortured to be killed and i was tortured and while i was tortured he negotiated for my life he had a change of heart and a deal was struck he was to go to work for the politician who was in charge of the network and um and he got me out Where did he, when he got you out, where did he take you? He took me back home with his instructions, how to be at home. He gave me pills, opiates to deal with my mother, whom he knew would be very angry. So I used that, those pills. And it wasn't easy to be back home for sure, but I ended up staying there and leaving early as he advised me to do. I was interested to understand how, I, I mean, again, right now, this minute, I, I don't get how anyone heals from that, but you've got a first class honors degree and being able to do that, which I have a huge amount of respect and, and uh, admiration for the fact that you are sitting here right now with a, a smile on your face and talking to me uh, as coolly as you are. I just, that, that for me is a, I can't get my head around that right this minute. How did you start to heal? Where did the journey of healing begin for you? And was it with purpose? Was it by accident? Who did you meet that introduced you to certain ways, therapies, yoga, whatever it may be? Tell me a bit about that, please. So I was seeking. I was seeking. I didn't know what I was seeking. And, you know, my life was very random. It seemed very random. I was really following these instructions, but it didn't have anything about education and work and so i was just doing menial jobs here and there whatever i could get and usually didn't last very long i wasn't a good employee i i i, um, I got fired a lot and um i couldn't really do anything I, I couldn't really focus very well you know just massive ptsd do you how old were you when you started therapy um i was in my 20s so 26 i believe so that was the driving force behind everything. And I continued therapy. And then of course, everything that was added later on, I always write therapy. And I also had a sense of the spiritual, which I think is also very important in healing. I, you know, the, 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 the trust, the, the, the faith that there's a benign force, which I often felt in childhood when you're trafficked at the age of six years old by your own mother to a pedophile ring 
as a sex slave. I thought previously on previous podcasts I'd I'd heard the worst. I've never heard anything like that before. And I thank Annika so much, genuinely so much, for being so kind as to share that story. It's truly, truly heartbreaking. The reason I do this kind of stuff is that I want you to know that there's people out there that might be going through stuff that you're not going through, going through tougher times than you're going through. And that when people like this have hope, you can have hope too.